In this video, I'll give a brief overview of the software in general and the, the various aspects of the code. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, Puma is a software to do material properties and material response as, as well as visualization uh, based on microstructures. These microstructures are typically gotten through the use of X-ray microtomography, but they can also sometimes be artificially generated for um, verification purposes, but sometimes other purposes as well. So with that in mind, the first aspect of the code is the import of X-ray microtomography. Uh, each of these aspects of the code will have its own video um, explaining it in more detail and will also be explained in, uh, in the most detail in the Puma user manual. For microtomography import, you can import a three-dimensional TIFF image shown here as TIFF stacks, select a subdomain for analysis. Um, for the purposes of this overview, I'm going to select a very, very small sample. Select the appropriate voxel length and import the domain. The next step is the thresholding method where in this case it's, uh, it's thresholded into the difference between fibers shown here as the lighter color and void shown as the darker color. And after the thresholding, the image can be visualized and uh, you can see the basic carbon fiber structure. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a very small sample. Typically analysis would be done on much, much larger samples. But for the point of, uh, of brevity, I'll do it on this, on this small sample. Now, instead of importing the microtomography, you can also generate a variety of artificial um, materials. One option is artificial carbon fiber preform, another is a packed sphere bed, uh, another is a simple sphere or a periodic sphere structure, and then a simple box and cylinder. Uh, the bottom three are used pretty much entirely for verification purposes. Um, for the example here, I'll generate a small sample of um, carbon fiber material. which you can then see here. And the idea here is to roughly mimic the structure of uh, one of the tomographies, that, uh, an example of which you see here on the left. But for the rest, we're gonna go back to the microtomography sample that I started with. Uh, I'm now gonna move on to the material properties aspect of the code. Um, the first material property is the porosity, uh, which you can see there at the bottom, which is simply a result of the thresholding that's selected. Um, for a good tomography, the porosity doesn't have too much sensitivity to the grayscale that's chosen, plus or minus a few points. Uh, if, however, the tomography is taken uh, with a threshold that is very inappropriate, it will change the porosity pretty significantly. In this case, you can see we're about 20% material, 80% void. Uh, the next material property is the specific surface area. Uh, if you see here, if you can zoom in, uh, you see that this is actually made up of triangles. This visualization is a collection of triangles, uh, probably a few million triangles in this case. The sum of all the areas of these individual triangles can be used to compute the surface area. Uh, which is done here. So you see the specific surface area is shown, which is the surface area divided by the volume, and then as well as the raw surface area. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, a few million triangles, this is uh, 2.45 million triangles. The next material property is the effective thermal conductivity. The effective thermal conductivity is done in each direction. Uh, if it's an isotropic material, it should be approximately the same in each direction if the sample is, is large enough. Uh, the basic theory behind it is that a temperature gradient is imposed across from one side to the other and then the steady state um, temperature at every point in the three-dimensional space is determined and from that you get your heat flux and then your, um, your effective thermal conductivity of your overall material. In order to do this you need obviously the microstructure but you also need the conductivity values of the constituent parts. 
In this case, we're using 0.0257 watts per um, uh, watts per meter Kelvin as the thermal conductivity of the air and 12 as the thermal conductivity of the carbon. And we'll run it just in one direction. As you can see, it's an iterative solver that uh, will basically iterate to steady state, should take on the order of, of 30 to 100 iterations in order to do so. As you can see, based on the system monitor, every computationally expensive aspect of the code uh, has been fully parallelized. The next material property is the effect of electrical conductivity, which is numerically um, exactly the same. We don't need to run it again. You impose, in this case, a voltage differential, and you solve for the steady state voltage potential, which is then used to solve for the, uh, the current flow through and your effective electrical conductivity of your material. Uh, finally, we're on to the tortuosity. In the continuum, the tortuosity is solved using a finite differencing method as well, where a concentration gradient is imposed and the steady state concentration is solved. And an example of that simulation is now shown here. Uh, the tortuosity is a material property that gives your material's approximate resistance to a diffusive flux. Uh, whereas if you think about permeability as a material's resistance to a, a pressure gradient, this would be a material's resistance to a concentration gradient. In the continuum, this finite difference method uh, works fine and will give you an appropriate value for the tortuosity. However, in the rarefied and uh, transitional regimes, these continuum methods break down and you have to use a random walk method that's capable of simulating the Newton effects. So in this case, uh, we vary the mean free path to impose a large Newton number and we can solve for our tortuosity factor in the rarefied regime using a random walk method. In this random walk method, particles are placed inside the voids and diffused randomly through the materials uh, whenever collision occurs with the surface, it is reflected diffusely and eventually you solve to um, convergence and you get out your tortuosity. The next aspect of the code is uh, representative elementary volume analysis. What this basically means is that for any given property, you are interested in knowing what the, what the sensitivity is um, in terms of is this sample that I'm taking representative of the overall material? Uh, in the case of the image you see here on the left, it is of course not. This is a very small subset, just so I can run the simulations quickly for this video. Um, typically for the carbon fiber materials like this, in order to get a truly representative volume, you're talking about something on the order of a millimeter cubed. Uh, this is maybe about a tenth of that, or a little bit more than a tenth of that. Uh, the representative elementary volume can be computed for each of the properties separately because it actually varies for the property of interest and the way we define this property as is the, the size of which it doesn't matter where in the material you take uh, the sample, the standard deviation of the values will converge to below a certain threshold, usually one or two percent of the property value. The next aspect of the code is the uh, oxidation simulations. Now the, the microscale oxidation model uh, attempts to mimic some of the physics involved in a high temperature decomposition. Uh, typically here we're talking about high temperature oxidation of, of carbon materials. This is done with a basic, um, a basic single value reaction model as a function of temperature and uh, diffusion of oxygen as particles, which I'll, I'll show here in just a second. It involves standard you know, temperature, pressure, mean free path, diffusion coefficient, um, atmospheric conditions, etc., as well as some, some numerical options. Uh, I, I won't go into too much detail on this now. There's an entire video dedicated to this, as well as um, uh, entire sections of the the user manual and a number of 
uh, journal and conference papers. But I will show one example simulation um, visualized to show the, uh, the oxygen particles. Now in this case what we have is a very high temperature simulation so we expect the particles to not be able to diffuse down very far into the material prior to reacting and all the decomposition or at least most of the decomposition to occur pretty much right as the, at the surface as the material um, decomposes. Now obviously what the surface is will change during decomposition. Uh, I'll run this for just a few time steps to show, to show what the decomposition looks like. Now obviously the simulation is, is being run to run quickly using unphysical parameters like I've lowered the density of, of the carbon fibers and, and so on, um, but it's just to get the point across of, of the capabilities of, of the, the oxidation model. And here as you can see the oxygen has been able to diffuse down and has been reacting with the surface, causing the surface to uh, recess. Since this is high temperature, this recession happens right at the surface, and we have very little uh, mechanical erosion occurring at all. So that gives a, a basic overview of the Puma software. Uh, as I mentioned, each of these aspects are described in more detail uh, in other videos, as well as in the documentation, and if the documentation and other videos do not help and you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, myself, which I'm listed as the, the point of contact in the documentation at joseph.c.ferguson at nasa.gov.